Well, hello and welcome once again to the Smart Money, Dumb Money Show. And as usual, I'm your host, Keith Richards. I'm president and chief portfolio manager and a technical analyst at Value Trend Wealth Management. And every once in a while, I like to break the show up and, and try something different. And many of you are aware I've been bringing in guests. So today we have a, a pretty, pretty neat guest because... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, this is a fellow that I've been in contact with for many years. Uh, we share charts back and forth, and his name is David Chapman. And, and people who are familiar with technical analysis uh, might be familiar with, with David's name. And David has, we were just talking about this and kind of laughing that, like, I consider myself an old dog in this business. I'm 60 years old, and I, uh, I got involved in the business when I was about 29 years old. So I've been about 31, 32 years in the business. Um, and David has been in the business for 50 years. So uh, he's been an analyst. Uh, he's literally got 50 years experience. And I'm, I'm just going to read off my cheat sheet. He's, he served as a chief economist. Uh, he's been a research analyst. He's been a technical analyst. And he started off, uh, he was just, David and I were just talking, uh, and he, he worked in the, the money markets and, and capital markets, um, you know, very early in his career. So he's got a very deep background and he's been both on the, the floor and right up to the, the uh, analyst level. And his specialty is really macro work. So he's very, very good at looking at the big picture. He brings in all kinds of interesting stuff that I never talk about. Um, so I think you guys are gonna find this interesting. So welcome to the show, David. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> It's fantastic to have you here. And so I'm going to start off because your your area, the thing you like talking about, mm -hmm. is the big picture. So everybody, you know, in case any of the viewers haven't noticed, the market's been in a bear market for the past year. Um, I'm sure everybody's noticed that. So the real question on a lot of people's mind these days is, you know, where are we? Where are we going? And sort of a macro picture thing. So maybe... David, if you don't mind starting off the, uh, the show, just give me some highlights on your sort of big picture view on things. And I'll pull up charts as you wish, because you've given me a few charts. So let's, uh, I'll let you give your well, picture. Th well, this has been a very interesting bull bear market so, so far, because what's, we're 10, 11, 10 months or so into it. Yeah. And uh, historically, that's about the length of a bear market. Uh, but there are a lot of markets that, stretched on for two, three years. And uh, this one is beginning to give off the picture of a market that is gonna last two, three years. Uh, we haven't found the bottom yet. I highly suspect by the time we're finished, we'll certainly be down about 50% from the highs of January uh, 2022. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why this is uh, happening. Uh, for years, guys like me hammered on the fact that uh, uh, that they were keeping interest rates way too low for way too long. Uh, they were pumping far too much money into the financial system uh, through QE uh, and uh, allowing the banking system to uh, expand itself in a, in a like, huge fashion. And that resulted in bubbles. And Bubbles, there's never been a bubble I've ever seen historically that has never been burst. And, uh, and it was funny because they, the 1990s was the decade of the high tech dot com bubble. The uh, 2000s were the bubble of the housing market, particularly in the States and, and elsewhere. They all got burst in the subprime mortgage collapse and the financial crisis that almost brought down the entire financial system. Uh, they, it was called the Great Recession for a good reason. It was the deep, deepest one since the Great Depression. Uh, it didn't turn into a Great Depression because they had tools that they were still utilizing, uh, quantitative easing, uh, interest rates at zero, but they kept them there for way too long. And uh, the result is, is that now we're entering what I believe is an historical bear market of greater proportion that only occur by calculations that I looked at and have read from some other analysts roughly every 90 years. And the last one, of course, was 
Great Depression. That was 90 years ago now. And I can go, I, I was able to go back and look, go back to about mid 1500s and, and it counted out some very big depressions roughly every 90 years, the last one in, in 1932. So now we're into, into the period of a potential new Great Depression. Uh, some guys are calling it the Greater Depression already and we're not even, theory, we're not even there yet. And depressions are not only characterized by a big bear market, they're characterized by currency wars, trade wars, and real wars. And we have all three of them present today. Yeah. And uh, the historically, when I looked at all of those, and even going back further, although I didn't have charts or anything to really count back further, is, was is that whenever an empire grows, uh, it eventually gets beyond itself and it gets challengers to its top dog. And of course, the, the big kahuna on the street has been the United States of America uh, since 1945. And uh, it's now being challenged by some people will say it's been challenged by Russia, which it is, but the real one is China, the rise of China. And the previous depressions saw the end of the, the British Empire. Uh, two world wars finished the British Empire as a major entity, and, and it was where the US, United States Empire effectively took over. And I could go back further. Uh, and the challenger for the British Empire was the German Empire, the growing German Empire. And no surprise, they eventually ended in war. But prior to all that, which most people don't really pay attention to, there were currency wars, trade wars, <laughs> and, and then they intensify in the 1930s and they, they fought the wars all over again. So uh, here we are. <laughs> yeah, you sound, you sound like um, you probably read the book The Fourth Turn then. Yes. Yeah, yes. so it's interesting because uh, another guest and a longtime friend of mine, uh, Brooke Thackeray, uh, he introduced me to that. You probably know Brooke; he's a seasonal guy. Actually, I've uh, I've never met I've never met Brooke. I know I know Don Villa. Yeah, well, Don Don yeah, Don, yeah, Don, Don Villa, would, would, Brooke Thackeray. So yeah, yeah, I've I've talked to I talk I uh, I talked to Don. All, well, I don't talk to him every every week, but uh, he gets the material every week, which okay. he apparently posts he posts in his own stuff that he sends out. Okay. So, well, Brooke introduced me to that book, and yes, I, I, I understand what you're talking about when it, it's uh, it's basically a, a changing of the guard, is what you're saying. Uh, yeah, and, and it, never, it never goes easy, oh. uh, and it takes years, maybe yeah, even a big, big, big picture. Cu couple, couple of decades, uh, yeah. and uh, it could be, the only problem is, is that uh, uh, this time, everybody's facing each other with nuclear we weapons. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we we don't want to we don't want to know how that one ends. <laughs> no, no. So actually, it's interesting. You you also brought up. Uh, you said you know you think the market can be cut in half, and I I, I sent it to you, uh, David. But I, I posted a uh, blog called the Worst Case Scenario, yep. and uh, it's got a line that's very similar to the work you've looked at. It's a big long trend line going back you know a gazillion years, and yep. and. Basically, uh, you know, the intersection of most, you know, large long term support and that trend line comes mm -hmm. in around 2500 or so 24 2500 <laughs> for the S&P. And that uh, that lines up with what your comment is about a 50% haircut from the 48 something that we hit. Yeah, on the I, mean, I was looking at uh, 18 to 20,000 for the Dow. Yeah, so which would be effectively cut it in half. And Jer um, Jer I quoted in that particular blog, uh, Jeremy Grantham, I hope I'm saying his name right, uh, yep. has has been on in that camp. So a 50% haircut is, on the market is actually not, I mean, when we talk unusual. about- Unusual, it's not unusual. It's not unusual. And we saw, well, we actually saw it in, in both 08, 09, and in yes, 01, 02, right? So- Yeah, uh, 01, 02, we saw it in uh, 73, 74. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, Nixon uh, thing, Cuban. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. So it happens. Um, and so this is, yeah, I, I absolutely, in fact, I've been spelling out 
my my readers of the blog and whatnot that there's different levels of support but the ultimate level would be around that 2500 well i mean level. even even we're guessing we'd hate to think that it would be a great depression type collapse that was 90 yeah. percent. so yeah, uh, yeah we don't we don't want to go there we, we won't, well, yeah, i won't bank on that but it's it's always anything you know else, right? and as i even point out i mean there's a lot of numbers coming out i mean the last job numbers were horrible or anything like that uh we we don't have uh huge lineups at soup kitchens, although uh, I've picked up figures for food banks, and apparently they're up sharply in the States and in Canada. Uh, we don't see people riding on the rails. Uh, we don't see uh, uh, tin shack camps, but we have tent camps in our in our parks. So, yeah. and, and homelessness uh, has uh, risen despite the fact that markets went to an all time high because the divergence between, let's call it those that have it and those that don't has just gotten wider over the years. And the policies of the, uh, of the central banks and, and the governments, uh, they're all at fault. Uh, everybody's to blame. Uh, favored more people to get rich as opposed to, uh, to uh, and it raised uh, poverty levels. So, uh, and, Massive inequality always ends badly. Yes, that's right. so it's uh, and that's actually covered. And, and the worst and the worst case is is Keith. We don't want to know about it because they come and they chop our our, our heads. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's going to be uh, there's going to be benefits to, poor, to being poor. Um, so I actually I'm going to pull up. Uh, I'm going to share a screen and there was a chart you gave me of the Dow. And um, just uh, for the audience, FYI, um, David's one of these people that, that has a pretty broad understanding of, I mean, his formal training is in economics, but he's got such a broad understanding of so many different topics and analysis. And one of them is, is well, he's not a, he doesn't claim to be an Elliott Wave expert, but he, he has a pretty decent handle on it, probably a better handle on Elliott Wave analysis than I do. Um, so I noticed on the Dow chart you sent me, there were some Elliott uh, notations. So mm -hmm. if you don't mind, I'll, I'll share the screen. And I just want you to walk us through this. So bear with me. I mean, the darn, oh, there it is. Okay. So um, hope everybody can go. see this. That's the Dow line. So if you need me to move my pointer around, tell me to do so, David, and I'll, I'll point at things, but maybe you could verbally start walking us through what we're looking at. Well, this one obviously starts from the uh, period of the Great Depression, and uh, this is a labeling of a, another Elliott Wave analyst uh, by the name of Ron Rosen. I've seen other people label it slightly different, but the end result is largely largely the same. Uh, that uh, out out of the Great Depression, uh, there was a big a big monstrous wave down, and then followed eventually by a big monstrous wave up, which uh, topped uh, ultimately in 2000 with the dot-com bubble. Uh, and, and the intermediate waves uh, were, were the top in 1937, the bottom in 1942, and then the third wave up uh, took us to 1966, and that whole period, 66 to 82, yep. which was that rough Sorry. little period there, yep, uh, is, is our fourth wave and the fifth wave up. Because Elliott waves always rise. They are, Elliott wave theory, in some ways, is quite simple. They rise in five and fall in three. <laughs> but getting there sometimes can be extremely complex. And what's easy about looking at a big monthly one is the waves just leap out at you, as, as it did on this one. They just kind of leap out at you. Whereas uh, you try to do it on a day to day basis or a short term basis, yeah, you. You get buried, <laughs> and I don't even try. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, it was a very important top in 2000, and that created what we called uh, wave four of this wave up, uh, which was the made up of an ABC, very nice ABC, the 02 bottom, the 07 top, the 09 bottom. And what we've been in since then is wave five. And wave five is a very speculative wave to the upside and ends in a bubble uh, as well. And uh, that bubble has probably now burst, but it isn't finished by, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I've lived through 
th this is my third major bear market since I came into this business in the late 60s. Of course, the first one was the era of 66 to 82. The second one was the 2000 to 2009. And, but this is a big one because it looks like a fifth wave has topped. And if a fifth wave has topped, we're in for more of a uh, correction on the scale of the Great Depression. That's that's scary every time you and, talk about it. <laughs> yeah, but but it doesn't necessarily mean stock markets are going to fall ninety percent, which no. uh, they did. Uh, actually, uh, it's not drawn on there, but that uh, whole period from uh, nineteen twenty nine to nineteen forty nine. If you look at it carefully, uh, uh, you you would notice that if you drew lines through there, you'd notice that it formed a very lovely uh, symmetrical triangle which had burst out of in the early 1950s. I can, yeah, I actually can see that. That's yeah, right. yeah. And, and, we, and if you were to draw lines from that bottom in 1932, uh, I didn't want to clutter up the chart and draw them along the uh, bottom of that uh, 1974 bottom, uh, it actually comes in somewhere around 8,000 today. Uh, so you'd have to go to the steeper one starting from that 1982 low and draw it up connecting the uh, 2009 low. And you would find that today it comes in around 18,000 on the right. Dow Jones. Wow. So that's, that's why awesome. I figure things return to the mean uh, and 18,000 would be a, about a 50% correction in the Dow Jones and would not be out of question uh, because historically all through those earlier periods, uh, every time things did get out of line, they have all returned to the mean or, or went below it, or they spent a period below the mean in order to keep the average going out. Yes, stocks only go up over a long period of time, but there can be very long periods where it takes you years to get back to break even. Uh, 1929, I think it took to about 1954, 55. Uh, the, uh, to the 1970s one, I think it it took about to about 80, 85, or 86. Before. That was a 17 year period of, yeah, of yeah. where the Dow yeah, couldn't yeah. crack a thousand. Yeah, right? yeah. So and the uh, 2000, 2009 period, it took to around 2013, 2015. August 13, before it broke out. That's yeah, right. before yeah. you finally uh, bro broke out. I mean, that, it, it's kind of simplistic because we know darn well this is you know a buy and hold guy that just buys and then just rides through the whole whole thing. Yeah. Uh, speaking of riding through the whole thing, uh, something I've always told my clients when I was a, uh, a stockbroker, uh, and you probably do the same thing is you never sell into panics. <laughs> so <Okay>. you don't. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> because so, you're, you're usually selling at the bottom. <laughs> that's right. It's, uh, it's actually, um, my audience knows this, but I'm, I'm, my specialty is in sentiment trading. So yeah. uh, you can use tools to actually help you find out when, when money is panicking and, and when money is exuberant. And most certainly we got all those exuberant signals at the end of last year where uh, I was selling out and I'm sure you were too. And uh, we're, we're different in portfolios. But <laughs> yeah, well, you have a lot of, uh, so actually, and that, that brings up another subject is the portfolios though. You know, I noticed you've overlaid gold here, but why don't there's a there's a we're talking Elliott waves. So would you mind if I pulled up because yep. gold is one of the things you like talking about lately. And and F, just as an aside, um, you know, I have avoided gold for many years for good reason. It hasn't gone anywhere, but we just started buying a value trend. And we're, we're never been, you know, gold bugs or anything, but we have been buying gold this year because uh, probably some of the reasons that you're going to talk about. Um, more, you know, inflation and, and uh, currency uh, overvaluation. Currency, currency. Yeah. So, so let's, let's talk about that. But first, let's go right to the, uh, right to the Elliott, and then I can bring up the currency stuff and, and other charts as you wish. You can see well, that. Well, a quick, a quick background on my interest in gold was just that uh, uh, on my resume, uh, I spent a number of years running the International Money Desk at the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. And, uh, and while running it, uh, a a steady buyer and seller of our euro loans 
was our precious metals desk, which kind of tweaked me. Why are these guys always doing this? <laughs> so uh, I wound up spending a, a week or so sitting with the precious metals desk, learning all about their business. Uh, and uh, eventually it translated into an interest in the, the history of gold has money. Uh, because uh, the history of gold as money goes back 3,000 years. Uh, and uh, there have been periods of experimentation of what we call fiat currencies uh, in the past. And every experiment with fiat currency in the past has failed. Uh, and as with most things, they don't fail overnight. And our current experimentation is uh, what dates from August 1971, when the United States of America took the world off of the gold standard, when uh, the US dollar had been convertible as a result of Bretton Woods uh, at the rate of $35 an ounce. Uh, a curiosity that most people probably are not aware of uh, was by 1950, uh, Bretton Woods was 1944, by 1950, the United States had the world's largest gold reserves. They had over 20,000 tons of gold. By 1970, 71, they were down to 8,000 tons of gold. And the reason was quite simple. Uh, has the US dollar sloshed around the world uh, for two prime reasons. One, the Marshall Plan, and two, the Vietnam War. Uh, central banks of the world kept running to the Federal Reserve and saying, here's my dollars, give me the gold. There was a large claim at $35 an ounce in the late, in the late 70s, early, early 70s, and the United States of America effectively defaulted. There you go. <laughs> How'd they do that? They closed the gold window. <laughs> that was the end of the gold standard and our latest experiment in fiat currencies. Uh, Fiat currency is basically the issuance of currency that the government says this is the currency and it is it is worth what I say it's worth. Yeah. During, <laughs> during the American Revolution, uh, they, they were... Absolutely. Uh, it happened during the uh, civil, U.S. Civil War. And there had even been periods before that. Uh, historically, uh, people would be curious to know that China was one of the first countries in the world to issue paper money. And, and that was way back, uh, my memory slipped me here, like 12th, 13th, 14th century, somewhere in there. Yeah. And of, co and of course, it, it failed miserably because they printed too many. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it eventually collapsed upon itself. Well, that, that doesn't uh, sound familiar uh, today at all. So <laughs> well, well, curiously, and it's not surprising, if one looks at the growth of money uh, since 1971, the growth of money has gone parabolic. Yeah. And uh, eventually, I've never seen a, par a parabolic move not collapse. <laughs> they all seem to collapse historically. So are we gonna collapse? Is this the time that we're gonna collapse? I, I don't know, I can't answer that. Uh, very simply, I had labeled this one again, the, the, the labels were very obvious. Again, uh, for years, uh, the gold was fixed at uh, $20.69, I believe it was, uh, revalued up uh, during uh, the Great Depression uh, under the uh, uh, Roosevelt administration, which was really just a, a devaluation of the US dollar, which had gotten very, very expensive at the time. <laughs> Sound familiar? Uh, because of uh, people rushing to the US dollar out of World War I and various uh, other things. Uh, so that peaked and gold went into a nice flat period, basically the $35. And of course that began to change in the very late sixties when the London gold exchange failed and then there was all sorts of other problems and it resulted in the, uh, in the 1971 a removal from of the gold standard uh, completely. Remember, prior, after Bretton Woods, currencies were fixed to the U.S. dollars within trading bands. Uh, a few years after 1971, 
currencies were set to float against each other. And the 1970s was a huge non-confidence in the US dollar as a result of uh, things like the Vietnam War, uh, Watergate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the US dollar went steadily down and what did gold do? It exploded to the upside. Now that it was free to trade rather than being fixed to the US dollar. That peaked in 1980, which is wave five there. Uh, and then followed a rather <sighs> grinding, steep, frustrating for the gold bucks. <laughs> 20 plus year correction uh, that bottomed in 2001. And then gold started to rise again. And the primary reason gold started to rise again was actually, again, currency problems. There was currency problems with the U US dollar, uh, again, uh, US invasions in, uh, out of 911, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, I could, could go on and there was confidence was being lost in the US dollar. And eventually that peaked in 2011. Uh, and, uh, and then we went into a correction. But if the major correction was that big ABC uh, from 1980 to I think the final bottom was 2001, uh, what we've been going through over the past little while is actually was the wave two of a new five wave up. So we're actually, I think, still in the early stages of wave three up, <laughs> which is, if you'll notice that from wave two down here at the bottom in 19, uh, what is that, to 70, 71, to wave three here in 1974, uh, that was quite a sharp move. So while we're going through a correction right now, I don't think it's going to be a devastating correction and it should eventually result in a new big up move. Uh, in Similar to the move that took us into uh, early seventies. Exactly. And, has, and it has a result of current currency wars that have been ongoing probably really since the last decade. Uh, it's quite fascinating in that the US dollar has been very, very strong. And for good reason, uh, you know, you got a war over in Europe and uh, that is, and uh, countries like Japan uh, got low inflation, so they don't raise their interest rates. Uh, there's been uh, some shakedowns and lockdowns and all sorts of problems in China. And the result has been, the, there's been a lot of capital flow out of those countries. Where do they go? They don't go to gold. They go to the U.S. dollar. Flight to safety. But, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, the U.S. dollar is viewed as the flight, flight to safety. The result is the U.S. dollar keeps going up. But that in itself is causing a problem in that uh, you've got all these currencies now falling and it's been requiring a uh, we've been reading constant stories lately of central bank interventions, uh, the worst one being over in, in the United Kingdom, where uh, the Bank of England has been on intervention, intervention almost on a daily basis in order to save the pound from collapsing into, I don't know what, <laughs> oblivion, well, I guess. So on, on that subject of currencies, you've, you've given me a couple of charts, and David, can you see my screen here? There's, uh, there's yep. this, I know this is a currency chart you did. Yeah, send that's, a, that's a big, really big picture. This is the other one, uh, the, the uh, chart of the other currencies here. The more current one is uh, the current situation. So so would you like me to pull up one? Yeah, or... pull up that one. Yeah, pull that the one, one I've up got first. My... Yep, okay, yep. So let's go with that. We'll okay. just have a quick, quick look at that one. Uh, I can't show everybody's currency, but if I could, the, the picture would be the same. Uh, gold and other currencies has broken out, has been up at or near uh, all-time highs. Uh, uh, the best, of, the two best ones there are the Japanese yen, which is the fourth one down, or, yes. and, and the, and the uh, British pounds. Uh, they are not far off of their all-time highs. In fact, the pound, who knows, it might even be making new highs. Uh, but if you look at the bottom, I got a gold in U.S. dollars, and it's yeah. just been in a steady downtrend. It hasn't even broken out. When the gold in U.S. dollars breaks out and starts rising 
in all currencies, then we're going to have the big move. Yeah. And I'm not quite sure what's going to trigger it because the U.S. dollar is causing a problem. Uh, too many countries, too many sovereign countries and corporations have borrowed their home currency. The result is they have to pay back ex increasingly expensive U.S. dollars, but their earnings are in their home currency. So let's use the, yen, the Japanese yen as an example. Uh, if they borrowed in U.S. dollars, uh, they've got to, they're constantly now having to pay back more and more U.S. dollars, and, and with or with depleting yen. So, so uh, it's, a pro it's a problem for them, and it's going to be a problem for the earnings season because uh, the multinational corporations of the United States, the bulk of their earnings are in foreign countries. So they're going to be in foreign currencies, which they got to translate back to U.S. dollars, and right. they're going to get a lot fewer U.S. dollars than they used to get. So we got two two potential explosions coming here, uh, lower earnings, which is gonna lower the stock market probably further. And we got uh, sharply rising currencies uh, and currency wars uh, effectively going on because it almost comes like a race to, race to the bottom uh, because yeah, it helps their exports, but it, uh, boy, does it make those imports more expensive, especially oil. I'll, uh, I should just mention uh, before we go to the next chart, um, these these charts are not actually the currency. This is gold versus the currency. So when... yeah, no, well, I'm all I've done is I expressed uh, right. gold in Canadian dollars. I expressed gold in euros, expressed it in pounds, expressed it in yeah. yen, and of course the one at the bottom because the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency. So everybody thinks of all commodities in US dollars. That's the yeah. way they quote it. I mean, if I, if I put up a chart of the S&P 500 in one of these foreign currencies, it would look a lot better than it does in US dollars. Yes, yes sir. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they still be losing money, but not, not at the same rate. In other words, okay. uh, uh, it, it has fallen because their currency has devalued. So the fact that the S&P 500 is in US dollars means that in their own currency, it's more valuable. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so I'll, I'll bring, should I bring this one up next? Yeah, step? this is a really long-term one. And when I used uh, in a money show here a few years back when I was trying to trace that uh, a reserve currency does not last forever. And I, I always like to think of the first reserve currencies that were noticeable uh, where, uh, really going back to ancient history uh, for a couple of centuries or so, uh, the Greeks issued a beautiful silver coin with an owl on it. It was known as the Athena owl and it was the currency of choice for trade back in, well, the Greek empire was what, 300 BC, 400 BC, somewhere in there. 400, 300, 200 BC, somewhere in there. Eventually they were replaced by the Roman Empire and their currency, the one that was widely used in trade was the Roman denarii. Well, like all currencies even back then, those currencies eventually collapsed. Uh, the, the Roman Empire in particular, uh, <laughs> almost, it almost sounds just like a repetitive <laughs> one of those repeating things that just goes on and on and on and on wars <laughs> foreign wars <laughs> and eventually the uh they started devaluing the denarii by cutting the amount of silver in it had the same effect as uh, printing a lot more money until uh, eventually it came to the point in the late fifth century i guess it was that uh, whatever the government of the day in the Roman Empire was issuing, nobody even wanted it, it was just junk. <laughs> and out of that rose at the time, uh, a, 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 what became a currency at the time was uh, the gold uh, 
uh, dinar or gold, uh, the gold solidus, it was called in the, in, in the late fourth and fifth century and into what was known as the Byzantine period after the, uh, after the Roman Empire broke up. Uh, which was basically Eastern Rome, and then that saw the rise of the uh, of the Arab states, uh, which, uh, if people don't remember their history, ruled uh, all of Southern Europe uh, from about 700 AD to about uh, 1400 AD. But eventually those saw the rise of other powers, and... and uh, and that's what's on this chart here. We're and that's what's on this chart. And one of the first yeah. ones uh, actually was a Venetian dinar, uh, but, although, but eventually it became replaced by the Portuguese one. The Portuguese were huge traders. Their currency became widely recognized and was used extensively around the world for about a century or so. Uh, and, and has all of these show, there was... A, there's a huge lead in period where the currency is there, but it's not the dominant currency. Eventually they become the dominant currency, but eventually they get challenged. Their empire gets defeated in a war yeah. and another guy rises. And of course the next one was Spain who, uh, who, who ruled roughly until almost the uh, 17th century till they were defeated uh, uh, initially by, uh, well, it was a combination of the British and the French, but the one that really rose to prominence was the Dutch Gilder. And they had their period that lasted well into the 18th century. And again, wars broke the Gilder. They lost the wars. They lost it against France. They lost it against Britain. and. Uh, the Dutch Gilder disappeared into the sunset to be replaced by the French franc, which lasted basically as a global currency until 1815, which uh, people know their history was a rather deadly day for uh, France uh, when they lost the Battle of Waterloo and the prominence rose to the British Empire and the British Empire pound sterling dominated for the next hundred years. Uh, and again, wars and challenges. There's always a challenger to every one of these. Portugal was defeated by Spain, Spain by the Dutch, Dutch by the British and the French, French by the, by, by the uh, British. And it wasn't the Americans who defeated the, uh, the British. Their challenger at the time was the German, the growing German empire, which I say is China today. Some may disagree, but today it's China that is challenging. The dominance of the US currency has the global hegemon. Uh, and uh, while the US reserve currency remains probably at least 60% in uh, uh, central banks portfolios, uh, has their reserve currency, they do have other currency. The yuan has been growing, but it is still not dominant. And, that's uh, that's actually an amazing chart. I mean, I'm actually probably going to put that on my blog at some point. If you don't mind, I'll I'll credit you with it. Well, I I guess it was probably a better lead in in the uh, when I when I did that thing for the Money Show a couple of years ago called a, a reserve currency does not last forever. So yeah. uh, that 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 kind of leads us in to the period of the dominance of the U.S. dollar, which has been the dominant currency since 1944 and Bretton Woods. Uh, but it was also rising out of World War I uh, because the British, the British took a beating. Yeah, they, they won the war, but took a beating. <laughs> yeah. you, know what I, you know what I mean? Right. And by the end of World War II, they were beaten. And by the 1950s and 60s, the old British Empire is falling apart at a rapid pace. Yeah. So, uh, so today we have... Uh, the American empire, uh, although many people claim that, uh, oh, how can it be the American empire? Well, I, I always say, well, they have 800 military bases all around the world. And that, that, that <laughs> and if you go and check what China and Russia have a military bases around the world, it's puny, <laughs> it's nothing. <laughs> so yeah, the United States of America is the global hegemon. The uh, major 
uh, world institutions, IMF, World Bank, uh, SWIFT, are all dominated by the United States of America. And that's why, led by China, again, in combination with Russia, they have been trying to build their own IMF, build their own World Bank, build their own SWIFT system to get out from under the dominance of the US dollar. And in all previous cases, the dominant economic power, in this case US, had to somehow destroy the challenger. <laughs> there you go. So, so today we face the America faces China, Russia, and how do they destroy them <laughs> without destroying us all? <laughs> yes, because they have those nuclear things, don't they? Yes, so, yeah, yeah, those little nukes that uh, both so, China and Russia. Yeah, I mean, have. even Putin's talking about using the the uh, the smaller nuclear weapons, not the more like, <laughs> tactical. Okay, let's use the tactical, well, so, not the real ones. You know, so, something something people never pay attention to, but the. Uh, uh, there were other reasons behind the American invasions of Iraq and Libya that were lost in the dust of bombs dropping. And one was Iraq uh, had made it crystal clear, because they were being challenged by the United States at the time, made it crystal clear that they would no longer accept U.S. dollars. They would only accept euros or other currencies for payment for their oil. Uh, the U.S. slapped them down with an invasion. Libya was the same thing. Mr. Gaddafi was trying to form a pan-African uh, group of countries that was going to use the gold dinar as the current dominant currency. Again, a challenge to the dominance of the U.S. dollar at that time. Take out G Gaddafi. They took. I mean, I'm not saying Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein are good people. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm merely pointing out the fact that currency wars were actually behind the invasions. But that's not what the public was told, of course. Yeah. Because, I mean, who, are you going to tell people we're going to invade Iraq because they're going to use the euro instead of the U.S. dollar? <laughs> I, I don't think that would go over very well. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Let's anyway, and that's and the challenge today is uh, is the growing use of the yuan, particularly throughout Asia, and uh, you know, and trade wars. It's it's amazing that trade wars are at the center of this because leading up to World War One, there were trade wars and currency wars. Leading up to World War Two, there were trade wars and currency wars, and here we are again. Uh, we've had trade wars. A member of the that under the administration of Trump, uh, they put all sorts of tariffs on China and there was retaliation, and even the tariffs put on Canada and Canada had to retaliate, Pete's sake. Uh, and uh, the, the other side of it was, was is that sanctions are really just another form of trade wars. And uh, you know, the country that is being sanctioned will find all sorts of ways to get around them. Absolutely. So, you know, well, I mean, so David, anyway, I mean, we, we probably have to wrap it up. Because, uh, it's a, but they're it's, fascinating it's, subjects. And, it's, it is. I mean, this is and they're too long. <laughs> you know, it almost we should do almost like a three part video series on on the history of uh, of uh, money and the markets. It's, it, uh, well, there's probably better guys than me out there that have really studied this stuff. But anyway, <laughs> well, it, it's amazing stuff, David. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, not on the video right now because we are running out of time. But I'm going to get you to maybe shoot me a, a list of recommended reading material for readers that are interested in the subject of, you know, the history of currencies and and, uh, and, and some, well, we could talk about the fourth turn we already mentioned, but those yeah, kind of reading materials that you might recommend people read to sort of uh, expand their knowledge. Well, it's basically reading about history. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Is, yeah. Um, amazing stuff. My dad was a historian, so but, and, you know, I mean, yeah. I always say, well, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. It rhymes. It rhymes. <laughs> That's right. Well, well, David, this is uh, this has been a very fascinating interview, and it's it's been very different from any of the other interviews I've done. So, oh, I okay, think, I think our watchers are really going to uh, enjoy. Oh, it. I hope they uh, enjoy it, and. Uh, Am I allowed to say I'm at www.enrichedinvesting.com? Yeah, you could say, yeah. Well, you just did. Uh, yeah. So uh, David's on the board of directors for Enriched Investing. Um, and uh, so he, uh, you know, and 
you know, I'll uh, I'll get you as I said to shoot me a list of, of reading material and whatnot, and I'll I'll put in a, a link. I'll to have to look. <laughs> <laughs> well, anything anything that comes to your mind, but yeah, I'll yeah. also put a link yeah. to your your contact. So, thank you, David, and uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll keep on uh, uh, communicating. And I uh, every once in a while I quote your work, so uh, it's been amazing to have you on. So yeah, thank you. Teeth split a slice. Uh, uh, where are you located? I'm in Barrie, Ontario. Not exactly a metropolitan, but uh, we get it done. We get it done. Well, maybe there's somewhere halfway for have a beer. <laughs> Absolutely. That'd be great. Well, well thanks, David. Mm -hmm.